All right. Hello. Hi. Uh, welcome to Visualizing Data London and to the Microsoft Reactor. Uh, thank you all for coming on Thursday evening. Uh, the theme of tonight is going to be uh, conflict data and open source journalism. We're going to have two talks and four speakers. And after the talks, we're going to do a quick announcement section. So you can already start thinking about if you have something that you would like to share. Uh, it could be an event. It can be a job opportunity. It could be an interesting opinion about bar charts or something. And then we're going to go to the pub. Our meetup is supported by a data visualization studio, Beyond Words, which is why we gonna start with Duncan Swain, a co-founder of the studio, who's gonna tell us a couple of words. Hello, uh, welcome to tonight. Um, I'm Duncan Swain, I'm one of the co-founders at uh, Beyond Words here in London. We're based over in uh, Brick Lane, uh, and we're, as Zdenek has said, we're a specialist data visualization studio here. Uh, very proud to be uh, sponsoring tonight's event, and we're passionate about bringing data to life. It's one of the things we do, telling stories with data. Um, and also trying to do as much good with data as we can. Uh, so I just wanted to use a few minutes of your time tonight to show you a recent project that we've been working on. Uh, it's just a sh short motion graphic, and it's about air pollution in London and a story that's very close to our hearts, and uh, it's very local to where I live, actually. A short piece um, and just a glimpse of the kind of work that we do. Um, so uh, that's not changing slides. We have a glitch. There we go. Okay. So uh, if you're interested in finding out any more, feel free to drop us a line. Uh, we are looking at the moment for freelance devs and for uh, a designer as well. We have a designer position open. So feel free to drop me a line. Okay, have a good evening. Thank you. And now, please help me welcome our first speaker, Nick Waters from Bellingcat. to the back of the room, yeah? Cool, um, firstly, thank you very much for having me here. I'm just gonna put on a timer to make sure I don't go over my time. Um, can I just get a show of hands? How many people here know what Bellingcat is or does? Um, actually, maybe even better, uh, who hasn't heard of us or has no idea what we do? Cool, okay, that's important. Um, so, give you a, a spiel about what Bellingcat is in a little bit, but don't worry, I will get to there. Um, the main two themes that I'm gonna be talking about in this presentation are, is using social media for monitoring, uh, and then using leaks databases and digital shadows. 
And both of these uh, are a huge source of data information for us when we conduct our investigations. So Bellingcat is an open source investigative website. Um, to give you an idea of what we do and how we do it, it's probably a good idea to explain the name first. Uh, so how many people here, or how many people here do not know like Aesop's fables, like the tortoise and the hare, like pretty simple parables, that kind of stuff? Everyone's familiar with it? Yeah, nodding feds, okay. So one of these parables is the, uh, the mice and the cat. So there was a family of mice, and they were in a man's house. And they were just getting along, you know, they're eating the crumbs that fell from his table. They're just like, you know, living life. And the man decided he didn't like that, so he got a cat. And this cat started hunting down, killing, and eating the mice. And so the, ma the mice held a meeting. And they had a big argument, and they said, you know, what are we going to do about this cat? It keeps on hunting us down. You know, this is, this is like the end. And there was a big argument, you know, big hubbub, until a young uh, mouse stood up and said, I know what we're going to do. We're going to put a bell around the neck of the cat. And all the mice, like, cheered for joy. They're like, yes, like, this is the, the end of this problem. Uh, you know, we've solved the problem, it's completely fine. And then an older mouse stood up and banged his stick on the floor. And he said, but who's going to put the bell around the neck of the cat? Is it going to be you? And the young mouse was silent. So we are the ones who put the bell around the neck of the cat, belling the cat, belling cat. And we do that by using open source information. Um, so there are different variations you'll find of uh, precisely what open source information actually is. But for us, our definition is any source that's freely available to the public or available to the public. So you don't have to be uh, a member of any specific group. You don't have to have any kind of specific clearance in order to see this kind of information. Uh, the vast majority of it is free. Sometimes you may have to pay, you know, like two, three pounds or something uh, or a little bit of money to get access to it. But as long as anyone can pay that money, we still count that as open source. Um, some people may get a little bit of an idea of what we do or the wrong idea of what we do. And it's not hacking, it's not stealing, and it's not spying. Uh, the majority of the information that we use falls into four buckets. First stuff is commercial satellite imagery. So stuff that you'll see on Google Maps, Google Earth, uh, Bing, believe it or not, is quite good in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, we'll also use traditional media sources because you know, they have reports on the ground uh, where the places we write investigations about, taking pictures, taking videos, which we will use. Um, and then we also use a huge amount of social media. And you'll understand why in a little bit as I go through some of the examples. And then the last one is leaks, dumps, hacks. Stuff that's previously uh, been hacked and is now online and anyone can access it. Uh, we still regard that as open source because we're not the ones who've hacked it. So although this kind of started off or like civil society really started using uh, open source investigation, especially to investigate conflict in 2010, 2011, 2012. Um, it's reached the point where this is no longer like a few, a few bloggers or a, a couple of small organizations doing this. We're looking at large uh, NGOs, large journalism outfits, and accountability mechanisms using open source investigation. So the New York Times Vision Investigations team is absolute highlight of that. They've done some absolutely incredible work using open source information. Um, how many of you have seen the BBC's Anatomy of a Killing about the execution of a yeah, family in, in Cameroon? That I sourced that develop initially. It starts off with Bellingcat Workshop. Absolutely incredible piece of work from the BBC. Um, you're looking you know, at Human Rights Watch has hired a head of open source investigations and you know, the UN are now looking for open source investigators too. This is not simply a kind of fringe part of internet subculture uh, with like weirdo bloggers writing about it. Um, the weirdo bloggers are now working for the UN. Okay, so social media for monitoring. So first thing you really have to understand about the kind of information we use is that everybody likes filming interesting stuff. Um, because there's different crowds here, I might get a couple of different reactions, but how many people here uh, do not own a mobile phone? No, everyone here opens a mobile phone. Um, how many people here are on social media of some kind? 
pretty much everyone. Okay, so what you effectively have is a network connected device that can take images and videos and you can then send that information to not only your own personal networks, but to huge numbers of other networks too, because that's what social media encourages. Effectively, you're part of one of the most powerful intelligence networks that has ever been created. It's wonderful for civil society, actually. And because everyone likes filming interesting stuff, there's always that kind of content there. So if a, say, rocket launcher pulled up outside here, started firing rockets, uh, down towards, I don't know, London Bridge. How many of you would run away? <laughs> I was in the army, of course I'd run away. How many of you would, you know, like hide in the building somewhere? A couple, yeah? How many of you would take out your phones and film it? You, I love you people, you're wonderful. In every single crowd of people, there'll be like, roughly kind of 10% to 25% of people who will take out their phones and film those kind of events. And people will risk their lives to get this kind of content. So this is a picture of a partially detonated IED uh, that blew up on London Underground train in 2017. Um, so it didn't blow up properly. It created a large fireball, um, burnt uh, quite a lot of people. I think it was in scores, if not hundreds, of people. Uh, it stopped at an underground station and people ran off. Some of them had the hair on fire, some of them were badly burnt. How soon after this detonated do you think this picture was taken? And why? Who, who said? Why do you say that? Because it's still on fire. So what happened is someone was at this station or on the train, saw everyone running off, probably some with their hair still on fire, went up to this thing, got out their phone and went, oh, look, a bomb, <laughs> and took a picture, okay? Like, people do this kind of stuff. And although there is a certain amount of, like, uh, maybe voyeurism to this as well, so I dare say most of you are familiar with that black episode, Mirror, where everyone follows around the, the woman with their mobile phones, there's also a certain amount of wanting to bear witness. And people will take this kind of content in conflict zones especially as well especially with events that are unusual. And because social media is designed to be addictive, you know, you get that little like, that little retweet, that hit of endorphin, it encourages us to share with our friends. And because we're naturally gregarious, we want to do that anyway. So the result is huge amounts of data. Images, videos, uh, statements, pictures of fancy food, cats playing pianos, but also current events as well. So has anyone here heard of a twitcident? Maybe. One or two. OK. Um, so if I was looking for keywords related to a certain event, say a train crash, I'd be looking for words like train, crash, derail, hurt, injured. And over a period of kind of a day, 24 hours, you'd see like these words being used randomly across social media page. But if there was actually a train crash, you'd see something quite different the number of social media posts using this term suddenly skyrockets. And that is a twitcident. So if we took a little bit uh, closer at this event, we can see some interesting stuff. Um, so firstly, we can actually see, um, often with an alarming degree of accuracy, what time the event occurs. So you can imagine after a train crash, like the vast majority of people, just like the rocket launcher, are going to try and escape. There's always going to be one lunatic who sits there and goes, Oh, I've been on a train, just derailed, I've been on a crash, got to get off, um, and post it before they get off the train. The same thing happens in airstrikes as well. You'd see also after the first media report, you'll see that the numbers exponentially skyrocket of social media posts because it's not simply the immediate network of people affected by the event who are posting about it, it's lots of other people too. That means that a lot of this content is less or more difficult to verify. It's usually not as related to the event as the stuff you'll get here. And this is the kind of content that we as Bellingcat aim to use for our investigations. And just as a uh, demonstration of that, this is a uh, twitcident of an airstrike in Yemen in a place called Mustaba. And you can see when that event took place, you can see the number of social media posts about that airstrike in Mustaba. So this isn't just something that's happening in my head. This is a real observable uh, event. 
And the kind of content that gets posted is the stuff that we aim uh, to whoop, identify, to verify, and then amplify in our Rollers Bellingcat. So to give you a little bit of idea of this kind of content and how much information you can get from a single image or a single video, I'm going to show you something. Um, is anyone here familiar with Mr. Wafali? Couple. So Mr. Wafali is a warlord in Libya. Uh, and in 2017, he was subject to the first arrest warrant based entirely on open source evidence. So that is evidence uh, videos posted to a Facebook page. These videos showed Mr. Wafali executing large numbers of people without due process. And when this happened, we went to these videos to try and find what kind of information we could squeeze out of them. Um, to give you a heads up, this video does show uh, the after effects of some of these, uh, or one of these executions. It doesn't show it very clearly. It's not gory at all. Um, but you do see some of the bodies within the video. Um, so just a heads up for anyone watching. So this is the video. You can see the detainees on the left-hand side dressed in orange jumpsuits, which is deliberate. Now, what we want to do is try and work out precisely where this video was filmed. Now, when you're watching a video, you can only see a single frame at a time. But if you take those frames and then stitch them together into panorama, you can see a lot more visual information all in one place. And within this panorama, we identified several features which allowed us to work out precisely where uh, this execution happened. So in the back left, there are some buildings. On the right-hand side, there's a wall. And you can see the fork in the road as well. So we need to find a similar place to that in Benghazi. And actually, these buildings with the large aperture at the bottom are actually quite common. Um, it was a place called the Chinese Housing Project. And there had been a lot of fighting going around around the area at the time. So we knew roughly where in Benghazi we were looking. But we need to find precisely where. And when we do these geolocations, we usually match up a lot of different features and work out precisely where the event took place. We can usually work out precisely where the camera was located and where the actual event took place, often within uh, a few centimeters, a couple of meters. And this is just using commercial tools, or like not even commercial tools, free tools, like Google Earth Pro is by far the best tool we have. And that's free. Anyone can download it. It's great. But we located a place in Benghazi we, we thought matched. So at this location, uh, you could see the fork in the road, the buildings, and the wall in the same configuration that we were looking for. So we're pretty confident that this was the place. But we want to be really, really sure. So we looked at up-to-date satellite imagery, and we matched it up to the video. And we saw that you could actually see the bushes seen in the video match the bushes that you could see in satellite imagery. And this was further confirmed as we were looking at satellite imagery when we saw these black dots appeared at the junction. And it took us a while to work out precisely what these black dots were until we established they were actually the bloodstains of the people who had been executed. Next, by looking at the, the shadows of the people within the video, we could work out the time. Because a human standing up effectively becomes a sundial in those kind of conditions. So you can, because we knew the rough date, we could work out the rough time, which is about half past six in the morning. And we knew the date because we had the satellite imagery between the 15th and 17th of June. So we knew precisely where it happened, what time, and the rough date range in terms of date as well. And that kind of information is absolutely invaluable to investigators, especially at, say, the ICC, the UN, who can then establish when and where this kind of event took place. Cool. 
Any questions, uh, any kind of quick questions on using social media for, for monitoring before we go on to the next theme? Yeah. Um, depends how much information. If you have a lot of contextual information, a couple of minutes. Um, for stuff like that, that took uh, a couple of weeks with three people uh, working for about mm, six hours a day doing it. So, a long time. Cool. Yep. Yeah. Live on YouTube. Um, how do you actually access the information on social media? Is it shared to you directly, or do you sort of? No, this is all information that we have discovered. So, it's all information that's been posted publicly. Which is a good kind of segue onto the next part of the talk, which is leaks database and digital shadows. Now, we've already established that most people here, or pretty much everyone here, has a mobile phone, mostly on social media. But even if you haven't interacted with social media, um, you still left a digital trace. Uh, if you've interacted with pretty much any kind of system or service uh, in the last few years, uh, you will be present on those systems, whether that be private or, or government. Um, so, a lot of the problem with this digital kind of trace is that it's quite permanent. And sometimes you might do something that's kind of dumb that you really wish you hadn't done, that got posted on social media, and you kind of like regret it quite a lot. Um, which for like me is a little bit embarrassing. But if you're these guys, it's a bit more than embarrassing. Um, so is anyone not familiar with these guys? A couple, okay. So, Mr. Petrov and Mr. Boshirov are the cover identities of the two guys who tried to poison Mr. Skripal, uh, the Russian defector. Um, initially, we were kind of looking at this and we were thinking there's no way we'd find out who their real identities are and who they work for. But then we saw this video. What were you doing there? Our friends had been suggesting for a long time that we visit this wonderful town. Salisbury, a wonderful town? Yes. There's the famous Salisbury Cathedral, famous not only in Europe, but in the whole world. It's famous for its 123-meter spire. It's famous for its clock, the one of the first ever created in the world that's still working. Um, yeah. So when we saw that video, we were like, no, we have to take a pop at this. Like, we have to give it a go. Um, so what I'm going to do is just take you through a very, very shortened version of how we identified Mr. Petrov, um, who eventually worked out is actually a Dr. Alexander Mishkin. Um, so what was unusual with these cases and the current cases that we're carrying out, especially with uh, intelligence agency activity within Europe, uh, is that we combine both the open source information I was talking about earlier with uh, traditional journalism, uh, human sources as well. Um, and I'll show you how we did that. Um, so when we initially started looking for these guys, um, there was very, very little trace of them. Uh, I think Petrov had like a empty Facebook account with a single picture, which we actually later found out that he was using to communicate with a woman he'd met in Prague. Um, apart from that, very little. Uh, so we used a human source to obtain their um, international passport dossiers, their cover international passport dossiers. And we figured that if you're gonna create a cover identity, you're not gonna change every single piece of information because that makes it actually quite difficult to remember. So we figured maybe the birth date's the same, maybe the first name is the same, maybe the patronym's the same, you know, maybe the last name's the same, but we figured like there might be a couple of details uh, that might be the same. The problem was there was so much information uh, to query, so we need to narrow it down. And so when we attained their international passport dossiers, we noticed that Mr. Petrov's had been issued in St. Petersburg. So we started looking uh, in information related to St. Petersburg, or database related to St. Petersburg. Um, and I'll talk you through how to obtain these databases in a second, but there's a lot of them. If you're a low-level uh, Russian civil servant, you're not getting paid enough, you can supplement your income by selling the information that you have access to. And so there is lots of this kind of stuff online. It's very easy to find, a lot of it is free. And in a leaked 2013 St. Petersburg passport, uh, sorry, address database, we found someone who had the first name, the same patronym, and the same birth date as Mr. Petrov, which immediately aroused our suspicion. As we kept looking through these databases um, for Mr. Mishkin, we then found 
his Volvo, his registered Volvo, um, and the address it was registered to. Now, when it's talking about the kind of low-level corruption that affected uh, civil servants, like, if you're in the GRU and you don't want to get stopped by police, you don't want to get speeding fines, where do you risk your car to to give a signal to the police that, hey, I'm untouchable? The GRU. <laughs> um, so that address is associated with the GRU. So at this point, we're very, or like, Mr. Michigan had the same first name, same patronym, same birthday, and also worked for the GRU, which is one of the Russian intelligence agencies. Um, and so we're pretty confident this is our guy. So we, again, through more traditional sources, obtained a copy of his passport, eventually, and then compared the face, or did facial uh, comparison between Mr. Petrov and the Mr. Mishkin, um, done by Birmingham University, who considered it a 90% match, at which point we were happy to publish and say that Mr. Petrov is Mr. Mishkin. Now, when I was talking about like, this kind of low-level corruption, being the Achilles heel for these guys. It wasn't just Petrov being lazy. When you look through car insurance databases, you know, stuff actually leaked databases that you can find online, so through torrents or websites, um, we found something like 250 people who had registered their vehicles to a GRU address. 250 people who work for a nation state intelligence agency. And like, this information isn't like, difficult to find, as I was talking about. Like, you can find these kind of websites um, pretty easily if you know what to look for. Um, so these are a load of databases for the Moscow region. Like, super easy. You just need to find the website for it. Um, and finding it isn't too difficult. Uh, so does anyone here know what the British military slang is for to tell stories? It's to spin dits. Okay? It's a weird phrase. No one else would ever use it. So you know that the only people who are using this phrase are probably connected to the British military. So when you put it into Google, you get you know, military results back. Does anyone know what a criminal slang is for a comprehensive list of people's details? That must be one or two people who know that. Fools. And if you type by fools into Google, <laughs> you just find all these places where you can buy this kind of stuff. Like, this isn't even the dark web. You can find this on the surface web really easily. And if you know where to look, you can find it for free. So this is an example of fools. So I've got Jimbo's, uh, full name, usernames, home address, mobile number, email number, sorry, email address even, social security number, credit card number, CVV. Oh, and it expires in November 2020, so it's still extant when I found this. Uh, like the IP address, security question, what car they drive, the passport number when it's issued, all that kind of stuff, the relatives. Like, this is the information that I need to steal this guy's identity. And I, I just found this because I knew what keywords to use. So you can find this kind of content pretty easily. You just have to understand the context in which you're operating. Um, that's quite a whiz-bang quick tour. Um, I think I've got five minutes left or so. Hmm. Yeah, uh, for questions. So, yeah, if anyone has any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. Uh, please wait for the mic with the question. I think it was the first one. Hi there. Um, with the low-level hacking stuff, is there any with the what sir? Low-level hacking type um, databases that are available where other people yeah. have hacked beforehand. Are there any issues of um, ethics, um, ethnics? What the ethics of them? Yeah, ethics. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So potentially, if you a lot of these databases you can find for free, or you can access for free. You can download them. It's not difficult. Primarily, these are used by criminals. So once they're a couple of years old, they're uh, pretty much worthless because they need up-to-date information. Um, so for our purposes, we could get the vast majority of free. Um, you can buy more up-to-date versions, but at that point, you have to weigh the ethics of if you believe it is in the public interest in order to pay a criminal like the $10, whatever it is, to get access to it. Um, you know, so you have to weigh up you know, like the fact you are handing money to a criminal um, with the public interest there. Um, so yes, there is an ethical question there. Stolen. I mean, yeah, but it's open source information, so we regard it as fair game. Um, in terms of that, uh, when it comes to like using a database that anyone can access on the internet anyway, um, and the public interest, like the public interest is way up there anyway. Yeah. More questions? That's one. 
How was your work affected by GDPR, May 2018? Um, a few different things. We have to make sure we protect that kind of information if we do use it. Uh, as you saw, like, for us, more like an, I think, ethical question is more restrictive than GDPR itself. Um, because although we had, say, for example, the names of those Russian intelligence agents or people who worked for the GRU, likely worked for the GRU, we never published it because we didn't believe it was ethical to do so. Um, in terms of investigations, uh, the loss of Huis information after ICANN fell over was pretty um, devastating to anyone who's conducting these kind of investigations. Um, and it is incredibly frustrating that a uh, piece of legislation that was designed to kind of protect people has actually ended up making it more difficult uh, or less transparent to find who actually operates websites. Um, yeah, so in some ways it affected us quite significantly, in other ways not so much, if that makes sense. Okay. Question on this side, I believe. No? More questions? Anyone? Oh. So what was your route into doing this now? What were you doing beforehand? Oh, boy. Um, so I was an infantry officer in the British Army for four years. Uh, I was in Afghanistan, and it was, contrary to what most people's experience is, incredibly boring. Uh, so I left, did a master at KCL in conflict security and international development. And it was while I was there that I was started to be introduced to this kind of work. Um, there was a guy there called Christian Trubert. He currently works for the New York Times, previously worked for Air Wars. And I saw him trying to geolocate an airstrike. So he was looking at a video and then looking at a map. And I was like, hey, I've just left the army. I know explosions. I know maps. Maybe I can help out. Um, I then kind of got into the Bellingcat world after got a piece published on Bellingcat. And for a couple of years, while Bellingcat didn't have any money, I worked for cyber threat uh, intelligence, commercial cyber threat intelligence, uh, and then for a bank doing a kind of similar thing. Um, so I spent two years doing that. And then since the summer of 2018, I've been working for Bellingcat full time. So it's a kind of almost accidental um, fall into it, but it's been quite interesting. Cool. Cool. Um, we can do one more, maybe? Hi, I'm just wondering what the implications are of uh, improvements in, in technology of things like fabrications, forgeries, and deep fakes on Bellingcat's work. Yeah, cool. Um, so not as much as you'd expect. Uh, usually when we conduct investigations, we use a huge range of information, uh, and we, we verify each part of it. Um, it's actually very difficult to make a good fake. Pardon, I beg your pardon. So, for example, with a, a deep fake, there's always going to be that, or there has to be currently, that original video, which is then used to produce that deep fake. Um, so, you know, if you find the video of Obama saying something like really dumb, you could probably actually go back in time to find out which video that's from and then say, hey, actually, this is fake. Um, what is actually far more powerful and far easier to do, so it's done much more at scale, is taking a piece of media, say a video, showing, say, a protest or something, and that happened in Iran, and then taking that video and say, actually, this happened in Lebanon. And it's not true. It's a fabrication. But it's far, far easier to do. And so therefore, it's done much more at scale. Um, so though the kind of deep fake stuff is uh, or does affect us, actually, people taking media from other events and saying it's something else is actually far more of an issue. Cool. All right. If you have more questions, just talk to Nick. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to do a two-minute break so that you people can go to the loo and we have time to swap the speakers.
Uh, all right. Uh, so the next speakers will be introduced by Chris Woods from Air Wars. Um, thank you for having us here. Thank you for coming out on a horrible night as well. So I'm the director of Air Wars, but all, as will become clear very quickly, there's a reason why Air Wars is not giving the talk tonight. Uh, we were set up back in 2014 to, to grapple with the challenge of modern militaries not admitting civilian harm, even as some pretty catastrophic wars were going on in places like Iraq and Syria and Libya. Uh, the end of uh, the NATO intervention in Libya, for example, NATO gave a press conference saying, brilliant, we didn't kill any civilians, which was completely false. So Air Wars was set up really to try and capture what local communities themselves were reporting using many of the techniques that Nick's talked about with Bellingcat. What were local communities at a, really a local and, and hyper-local level reporting themselves? Could we capture that information, preserve it, and then leverage it with militaries and governments to, to confront them with the reality of, of the kind of wars uh, that we're currently seeing going on in, in places like the Middle East and North Africa? So we began as a tiny team. We're about 10 full-time staff now, currently monitoring about 30 belligerents across six conflicts, 53,000 civilian deaths currently in our database, each of them built from individual events upwards. Uh, the, the first iteration of our website was very much crash bang, chuck everything in. By 2017, it was clearly not fit for purpose. We couldn't. Uh, we, we had individual CMS pages with 70,000 words in them. We, we had no search engine function. It, it, the whole thing was creaking and falling over. I didn't think it was possible to build a, a data-driven website uh, at an affordable price. I assumed it would take us hundreds of thousands to build a great website. Uh, thankfully, one of our brilliant team members, uh, Sophie Dyer, uh, had more sense than that, introduced us to uh, Dan and Lizzie from Rectangle, and they came in and, and rebuilt the, the website from the bottom up, first of all, trialing with Libya, then the, then the website that we currently have. And that led to a sort of long-term partnership that we still have with Rectangle. So, so Rectangle are now our design consultants. We have, a, we have a, a set number of days a year that we have with Rectangle, and that's allowed us to plan both short-term and long-term and continue to build really exciting uh, parts of the site. We have two new... Uh, big chunks going live shortly. We're unveiling our Somalia data next week, and we've been working on a huge data set of uh, geolocating all of the credible, confirmed civilian harm events in the war against uh, ISIS. The American military, it took us four years to convince them, but they've released the entire locational data for every civilian they killed in Iraq and Syria, and that's something that we're launching shortly. Um, but here to tell you how they did that, how they built the site, are Dan and Lizzie. Thank you. So, so, am I on? Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks for having us and thanks, Chris, for introducing us. Um, we've got quite a lot to go through, so I'll just very quickly introduce the studio. Um, we're based uh, in Glasgow, so we just got the train down this morning. Um, and we met in the Netherlands, actually, where we both lived for uh, many years. Um, and I guess we sort of think of ourselves as uh, an interface design studio, um, an interface being kind of anything from like a poster to, in this case, uh, like a digital archive. Um, so yeah, tonight we're going to speak about um, our work with Air Wars um, and the ch like the challenges of uh, working with data at this scale uh, while still keeping a focus on the individuals and the communities that are affected. Um, we're also going to spend probably about 5% of the talk speaking about what was at least 50% of the uh, work of this redesign, which is uh, just creating and reorganizing a, a data structure for all of the information. Um, so as Chris said, we started working together in spring of 2018, uh, and that was to uh, update their site to accommodate um, their monitoring of uh, the conflict in Libya. Um, and over the course of this, we've worked with the whole team um, at Air Wars, but for, for this and the uh, redesign uh, very closely with Chris and uh, Sophie Dyer. Um, so we used the Libya um, conflict or this Libya update as a kind of test case for what would later become a, a full redesign of the site. Um, yeah, so 
part of um, Air Wars process involves collecting information about these civilian harm incidents um, and sort of documenting the, the metadata about them in spreadsheets. And at the time that we started working together, um, they were transferring that information into their CMS and sort of marking it up along with um, their sort of summary and like, like overall evaluation of the incident. And that, as a process, that kind of limited them to um, like presenting this information as, using just like a basic set of formatting conventions. So headlines, bold, italic, underline. Um, and there were some upsides of this system, which is that like um, it allowed them to kind of just use language to describe in as specific or as vague terms um, what, it, what had taken place. And also to um, sort of incorporate analysis that maybe um, was, didn't, wouldn't necessarily fit into a standard format. It could be like new, like yeah, it accommodated a lot of nuance in the in the research. Um, and so this is a challenge that we ran into when we kind of tried to sort of create like a standard format for all of this information. But um, this also meant that the information on the front end had to be represented in the uh, same way that it had been entered on the back end. Um, also at this time, information um, like these incidents were organized by year. So this is 2018. Um, and this is a huge amount of huge amount of information and like a hugely valuable resource. But um, and particularly for those who are using it every day, because you can sort of re like revisit this page and see the newest entries. But if you were sort of coming to this um, as like without without that background, then it wasn't necessarily very accessible. So our first step was to redevelop the back end and to break down these. Um, sort of gi giant pages into individual posts, and then those posts into individual fields. Uh, and this was a really difficult process given the um, specificity of the details that needed to be preserved. Um, and so that, that was, a, kind of, that was a, a lot of back and forth with, with Air Wars and with their assessors at that time. Um, and so we started by essentially scraping the uh, the original website, so just taking the raw HTML of the original posts and extracting individual pieces of information from them. And once we had that information scraped into a structured format, we could then reinsert it into the CM new CMS fields that we had been developing. Uh, so here on the left, you see uh, the new set of fields that we developed, empty, and then the image on the right is a fully filled in incident. Um, so yeah, once we, as I said, 5% of the talk, because <laughs> once we'd been doing this for really for months and months, um, and of course, once we'd done this, then Air Wars actually had to yeah, go through all of the um, incidents and sort of check the scrape. Um, but then we could kind of embark on a, on a redesign of the site. And the priorities were mainly to yeah, make this information more accessible, um, we had to think of a system that could be used across the existing conflicts, but also was kind of could expand to uh, accommodate new uh, conflicts that they might take on. Uh, we wanted it to be searchable, filterable, mappable, um, yeah, ma essentially making it more actionable for the people that were going to be uh, using the information. Uh, and also bring it to people that may might not have seen it before. So we always knew that uh, this restructuring uh, like what it would allow us to do is to create maps and charts and visualizations. Um, but first, we kind of we knew that we really needed to fully work out uh, the foundation of the project, which is the incidents themselves, uh, the, the assessments themselves. Um, so the assessment pages, they are uh, like a direct representation of the uh, information being entered in the CMS. Uh, so just look through this example from uh, the US-led coalition in Iraq and Syria. Um, so an assessment looks at local Arabic language news uh, and social media sources, um, including their images and videos. Uh, it looks at, they look at strike reports from belligerents as well as those belligerents' uh, own civilian harm assessments, uh, and also uh, a lot of geolocation information. And from that, Air Wars assesses the likelihood and the extent of the civilian harm that occurred. Um, that assessment results in a grading, so that's confirmed, fair, uh, contested, weak, and discounted. And generally, anywhere in the site, when these gradings, these grades are, we provide uh, um, a definition through a tooltip. Um, 
so yeah, our task was to present all of this information in a way that was sort of more clearly understood. That meant like breaking fields down into different sections of metadata, clearly defined regions for different categories of information, just basic graphic design principles, including typographic hierarchy. Um, and on the left, you see sort of metadata, like the unique reference code, date, geolocation information. In the center is the assessment itself. On the right, uh, a summary of the civilian harm, and then the sources. Um, there's also a section for any media uh, that was extracted from those sources, so that could be ground level imagery, it could be screenshots or embeds um, from social media. Um, of course, this, uh, media can often be graphic, so there's a, a, a switch in the, in the CMS for assessors to flag anything uh, that they assess to be graphic, uh, and you can unblur that, but there's a filter on it. Um, and for, for most of this conflict, uh, the US-led coalition published regular strike reports about what they were bombing and where, um, although this changed later. Um, and in some cases, they also published their own uh, civil, civilian casualty statements. Um, and so Air Wars would um, sort of keep, keep archived copies of these, also as they um, would sort of be modified like across multiple dates. Um, so those would be kept along with links to those original sources. Uh, the assessments also include geolocation information. This can be um, military grid reference system uh, coordinates from strike reports or uh, other satellite imagery where different details can be highlighted. In this case, uh, a particular neighborhood um, with a school. Um, another priority in the redesign was to be able to keep track of the names of individual people um, there's a big difference between um, sort of counting civilian casualties as a number and individually naming them. Um, this is also information that couldn't be automatically extracted from the, the previous versions of these um, uh, incidents, and so that was a big part of the um, work that was undertaken by the uh, assessors at this time. Um, and so with that information stored, like with all this information stored in individual fields, like at a sort of granular level, we could sort of redevelop a searching and filtering interface. Um, so this, all of these incidents can now be searched by belligerents, filtered by country, within a particular date range, filtered by grading, or searched with a like free text input. Um, and so this is the results for the word school. Um, and this, it, it's now possible to search across all metadata that's entered in the site, not just the um, uh, ass like assessment texts. Um, so yeah, once, I guess once that part was done, uh, we could start to undertake other representations of the, of the data um, across the site. So just in terms of a general structure, um, the homepage sort of gives an overview of all the conflicts uh, that Air Wars is currently monitoring. Um, and then each conflict has a page um, for itself. So this is the US-led coalition in Iraq and Syria, the Russian military in Syria, uh, Turkish military in Iraq and Syria, and uh, all belligerents, belligerents in Libya, and uh, not well, as to be launched very soon, um, US forces in Somalia. Um, and another really important aspect of the redesign is that more of this information was available uh, in Arabic. So the conflict pages uh, are also available in uh, Arabic. Um, and on the, on the conflict, on the home page and on the conflict pages, we use maps and timelines, which, and these are kind of intended to be a different entry point to the archive, so different from just the, the sort of search and filtering the assessments. Um, so this conflict spans two countries, so there's two different timelines, um, and the incidents are represented on this heat map. So you can, yeah, choose a date on the timeline, uh, see the, the map updated, and uh, like navigate to individual uh, assessments. So yeah, I mean, of course, this gives you an overview of sort of the areas most affected by the conflict, but also allows you to search for sort of for incidents in a, in a given area. Um, and there's a reason that we use heat maps. 
for these particular maps, and that's because there's uh, a var variation in the geolocation accuracy. So we've like felt like using you know a dot on a map is just sort of not uh, yeah a truthful representation uh, because there's this variation. Uh, so here you see there's accuracy f from uh, city, village, neighborhood area uh, are uh, within 100 meters. Uh, we're quite careful about this across the site. So um, when you click on a, a latitude longitude, we always show a note to sort of remind people of the accuracy and then don't show like a, a dot on the, on the map that opens subsequently. Um, but we really wanted the maps to still be interactive. So um, we kind of use this sort of viewfinder interface and basically you're, uh, underneath your cursor, uh, you can, uh, you probably saw in the, in the moving, uh, in the video, but you can um, see sort of how many incidents are within a given area uh, rather than clicking on the dot because we didn't want to lose that uh, interactivity. So yeah, that populates a sidebar, which like I said, takes you directly to that, uh, any given uh, assessment. Uh, so next on these conflict pages, we break down um, Air Wars estimate of civilian deaths compared to um, the belligerence estimate. Um, Air Wars' estimate is calculated from the number of incidents that they allege to be uh, confirmed or fair, and then you can compare this to the total alleged deaths and then um, the number assigned other gradings below. Um, so for us, like, data visualization is not just about like the, the, the maps and the charts and stuff, but also just presenting this kind of straightforward information in a, in a way that's, that's um, clear. Um, we present this information in a few different ways. So this is a, um, this is a timeline of civilian casualties per month uh, and broken down by grading. Um, on these timelines, we overlay uh, sort of contextual information, such as when like, particular battles took place. Um, and these stacked bar charts, like e each bar is, is summing the total number of alleged civilian casualties, um, um, the different segments being each grading. And these, this kind of chart can be quite tricky because it gets quite, pretty fragmented at the top and trying to track the number of confirmed deaths um, becomes kind of illegible. So all of these are also presented in like a stacked format. So you can compare one. Unstacked. Um, oh, sorry, unstacked <laughs> format. So you can compare one, um, just one uh, particular grading. Um, we reuse these charts across all the different conflicts. Uh, and do the same for the, the maps. Um, the, both the maps and the timelines were also translated to Arabic, so it wasn't just a, a question of translation, it was also um, like updating these interfaces as well to read from, from right to left. So the, t the timeline goes from right to left, the legend from right to left, um, sort of updating the overall layout of um, these pages, uh, including the civilian casualty numbers. Um, and on the home page, this is all combined um, to show all, like, all belligerents and all conflicts uh, overlaid in one timeline and map. And um, yeah, Chris mentioned actually in his introduction this project, The Credibles, which is not uh, it's going to be released very soon as well, uh, maybe later this month. Um, and this is kind of an exception to uh, another exception to using heat maps. Um, and this is a, a collection of around like 330 events, uh, incidents that Air War secured the precise location of from the US military. Uh, and it's really significant for a few reasons. Um, it's the most accurate and comprehensive data that the US military has revealed about civilian harm that it causes. Um, it sets new standards for um, other conflicts and it's got most, probably most importantly, it's got potential for, for uh, reconciliation claims um, by the affected communities. Um, so, this is a still, yeah. So the timeline here is a, is a histogram of uh, civilian harm from these incidents. And yeah, we have some difficulty dealing with time here because most of the events are in 2017. Um, so we have this kind of uh, shifting timeline that expands and contracts 
um, to accommodate the, the number of incidents in each year. Um, and because of the accuracy, now the geolocation accuracy, we can feel sort of comfortable to use uh, yeah, dots on a map. Um, and we also use uh, clustering in this case to, to um, accommodate for a large number of uh, incidents in the same area. Um, so in the interface, you can switch the clustering for, uh, between the number of casualties and the number of incidents, um, just to represent the sort of quantity of uh, harm within uh, an incident. Um, and then, yeah, by clicking on an individual incident, you can just open it uh, in view. Um, and yeah, we tried to use the timeline itself as another method of navigation, so not just uh, zooming around in the map. Um, so you can, yeah, drag around in the timeline to sort of progress through the years. Uh, and because of the accuracy, we also felt more comfortable to use um, satellite imagery here, which we generally don't uh, across the rest of the site. Um, like once an event is opened, uh, we show sort of as much about that event uh, as possible. So geolocation imagery, particularly ground level imagery, just to give you a sort of context from that satellite uh, image. Um, also the Air Wars assessment and the civilian ca casualty statement. Um, yeah, so this incident is accurate to within one meter. Um, and both the timeline and the map are filterable by uh, this text search. So here you see a search for Mosul, um, and it'll just give you all the uh, incidents, sort of filter the timeline uh, and the map to give you incidents that contain uh, Mosul. Um, you can also search for Arabic place names. Uh, so here there's just one incident. Uh, Misrfa in uh, it was a village in northeast Syria, uh, and yeah, maybe most importantly, you can also search for names. Um, so in this case, we search for the name Hassan, and the timeline again filters for any any instance that mention that name. Um, and we always show the names underneath the incident. So uh, here, there's 95. Uh, names, uh, always grouped by family, wherever that's uh, known or possible. Oh, oh yeah, so, uh, at the end of that video, uh, we also showed that uh, wherever possible, if the name can be matched to images from social media. Oh, sorry. No, it's not uh, okay. Um, so, yeah, this is uh, a more recent project. Um, recently, um, Air Wars has been sort of taking over from the Bureau for Investigative Journalism uh, monitoring of um, airstrikes in Somalia. And this involved uh, sort of a reconciliation between the Bureau's methodology and Air Wars. Um, so prior to m this conflict, Air Wars uh, has been primarily concerned with monitoring incidents that involve civilian harm, whereas um, uh, the BIJ had been monitoring all drone strikes of both, um, both civilian and mil militant fatalities. Uh, and this is information that we wanted to preserve. So uh, there were two, a few uh, like sort of fields that needed to be um, added and um, sort of built into the, to the assessments, mainly uh, to do with uh, the type of strike and whether or not it uh, involves civilian harm. And that involved an update to the... Um, to, uh, to the filtering interface to filter for incidents in, with, with or without civilian harm allegations. Uh, and filters for strike status, confirmed or alleged, and strike type, so airstrike or drone strike or um, uh, a few others. Oh, yeah, so did, did you miss one? No. Um, yeah, so I, I showed you earlier the sort of uh, conflict pages for the existing conflicts, but um, because of the difference, the differences here, we had to kind of uh, also do some changes and additions to the, the mapping uh, on the Somalia conflict page. Um, so we don't just have a heat map of the civilian fatalities, but also of the militant fatalities. Um, and 
yeah, in these conflicts, there's often a large number of incidents concentrated in a small area, so heat maps kind of already addresses that. Um, but here we wanted to map other properties uh, of an incident. So uh, we introduced clustering again. Um, so here we wanted to map sort of where the, uh, the strike was, but also whether or not it had been declared by US forces. Um, or in this case, um, wh like which groups the strike was targeting. So um, this is mainly Al-Shabaab, but there are a few others you can see in the legend there. Um, this also requires some more complex visualization for, for these maps. So um, as each incident or each cluster could contain more than one property, um, the first is just uh, yeah, one, one incident and one uh, val, one property. The second is a strike that uh, had two targeted groups, Al-Shabaab and Unknown. Um, uh, the, the first cluster there was three incidents with, uh, diff uh, again, more than one uh, targeted group. Uh, and the last cluster there, that's 17 incidents with, yeah, uh, like different uh, strike statuses. Um, but you can see that the, the viewfinder works basically uh, in exactly the same way, uh, just clicking on, uh, just navigating around and clicking on uh, clusters or individual incidents to see them in the, in the sidebar. Uh, and yeah, the, the, the goal is always to sort of get, you know, to get to the incident page. So these are always, uh, will take you to that incident page. Uh, and this viewfinder method works quite well for the clustering, actually, because you can kind of unpack what's in that cluster without having to, you know, zoom in and do some kind of spiderify uh, around the, that point. Oh. Um, we're going to end with a couple of things that we've um, made together with Airways to react um, to sort of ongoing events as they take place. So. Uh, we sort of mentioned earlier that in these coalition strike reports uh, that from, I think, 2014 to 2017, they reported uh, regularly where and what they were bombing. And in 2018, that stopped. And so this is an, uh, this is, this animation shows like, uh, this is like a visualization of basically the information that they reported themselves. What, on what date, uh, what, where these airstrikes took place, and, and th that will have to the creation of this um, timeline. So uh, when they decided to stop reporting this information, we made this video uh, that ended sort of with a call for them to restore uh, that level of transparency. Um, uh, a lot of this video work that we do, we actually create as um, interactive like interactive works that, so that they can also run on the website. So what we actually made was this interactive application um, where you can, uh, similar to the, to the other piece, like drag this, drag this histogram slider to scroll through um, this timeline. Um, and as you're dragging, it sort of shows you for, that, for one particular date, what were the, how many strikes in Syria, how many strikes in Iraq, with running totals at the bottom. And then to produce the previous video, we sort of like exported um, from this application. Um, also, as part of this, we make these sort of, so we let's can, like extract these sort of individual frames that everyone can post on social media, and that becomes like an, another sort of entry point for, for people online uh, into um, Air Wars archive. And we're going to end with uh, this video that we made to mark five years of the US-led coalition's campaign in Iraq and Syria.
Thanks very much. Yeah, sure. Yeah. All right, any questions? All right. Hey, first of all, I'd like to say your um, data visualization is fantastic. I thought it was really great and readable and um, understandable, brilliant choices. Thanks. Um, obviously, you uh, collected and normalized like a, what seems like a vast amount of data. Um, just wondering if uh, you've open sourced that or if there are any plans to open source that. So the strikes, not all of it, I mean, maybe Chris is better uh, to answer this question, but uh, that's not our decision to make, really. Like, we work with Air Wars, but, um, yeah, they are the ones doing the, doing the work. Although yeah. for some, uh, there have, I can't remember which one it was now, but there's one project the in, the, yeah, the, in, the, in the... The strikes. Yeah, where the, the data set um, yeah. for a particular, um, for like a particular project or for a particular data visualization will be made available online. Question somewhere over there? Yeah. Thank you, this is really interesting. Um, how quickly do you update the sites? So like how often is the sites updated with when an airstrike is coming in and stuff like that? It's, it's on all the time. Ongoing, yeah. like yeah. constantly. <laughs> yeah, we have, we have a team of researchers working 15 to 16 hours a day, and, and, and the site is endlessly changed. So yeah. It's actually quite a challenge to stay on that. And it's one of the great things about visiting and then design is it, being able to kind of foreground the new events and pick up and marshal that information. Yeah, and I think what uh, Dan said in the beginning about sort of transferring what was a lot of kind of uh, textual information into a, a schema, let's say. There's a really interesting challenge always, like how do you, you know, without simplifying information, so like a new conflict might come up, I mean, I might need to update like how an, uh, an incident is recorded in the back end, but yeah, it's always like a back and forth. We generally like will propose something, like how what could this work, and then the assessors will look at it and be like, no, that's, you know, we're missing this and this, or, yeah, so it's not just the front end is changing all the time, but also the, uh, the back end. Yeah. More questions? Thanks. I think adding names is really powerful and really, like, interesting and different because it kind of humanizes this whole thing. Um, I wondered whether you've had any uh, feedback from families who were affected, who kind of see their names or their relatives' names, and I was interested in perhaps what they were doing with this data. Um, yeah, I know, I mean, again, they are more likely to contact, well, they will contact Air Wars directly, but uh, on the Air Wars methodology page, there's a little section about... Um, yeah, that people have contacted, right? Uh, having seen their relatives' names uh, on the site. So I think with the, the credibles in particular, like providing an interface where people can yeah, search, uh, especially on these being incidents that have been, uh, like the precise locations being confirmed. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you could s speak more about uh, people contacting. Yeah, I, I, so I, I think in five years we've had one complaint and that was from a family because uh, we had used the picture of, of, a, of a young girl in a context that they, they were unhappy about, and we immediately changed that. But the majority of engagements we get from families are people reaching out to us saying, have this photograph, we'd like you to add this photograph, or here are photographs of the destroyed site. I think partly because what we're creating is, is a preserved archive of what happened to their loved ones. Um, and it's actually built into the Air Wars articles that, uh, you know, when these conflicts finish, which, you know, none of them have yet finished that we began monitoring, we'll look at ways of transferring back this remarkable archive back to uh, communities uh, for restitution and reconciliation. That's a really big part of what we do. Uh, because actually the digital terrain, the stuff that we capture, that Belling ca captures, is incredibly fragile. We, we reckon around 50% of conflict-related uh, social media posts are gone within a year uh, of being originally posted. That's because villages are overrun, people are killed, YouTube censors stuff, whatever. 
Uh, and so capturing and preserving that is a really important part of, the, uh, of, of what we do. We can do one more question, which was right here. Okay. So the, <clears throat> the information and data that you guys are collecting is really horrific. And how do, um, how do the researchers kind of protect themselves from the kind of scale and horror of what, what they're processing? Um, and also, who funds it? I think that's also a yeah, better question for Chris. For Chris. <laughs> It's a great question. I mean, secondary trauma is, is an increasing challenge for journalists, for researchers, for organizations like ours. The quality and the volume of the extreme material, by extreme I mean traumatic, I mean painful, I mean raw. So our researchers, assessors, analysts are day in, day out working with unmediated raw material at scale. Uh, and over time, this has become more and more of a, a concern and a challenge. So we have a trauma mitigation policy. Uh, all of our team, staff and volunteers have access to a 24-7 confidential helpline up to and including specialist trauma counselling. Uh, and we have a policy that says you can't work. We're a 9.30 to 5.30 organisation. When, when 5.30 comes, everyone leaves their work at the door. You don't take it home. Offices are light and bright. Everyone has to take lunch. You know, we try and make it as, 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 as open a space as it can be. But long term, I think we're still grappling with the challenges of that. Uh, in terms of funding, we refuse funding from any government or military uh, involved in any conflict we monitor. Believe me, that really hurts. Um, we can't take money from a large number of countries because they're bombing the crap out of lots of places. So our funding at the moment is almost entirely philanthropic donors. Uh, Open Society Foundations, Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust, uh, a couple of US uh, philanthropic foundations. So it's, it's yeah, and we, we do it for peanuts. So, you know, I think the, the entire annual budget of Air Wars is the cost of one large missile the Americans drop uh, every day, so, you know. We, we could do with more if anyone's got a couple of hundred grand. I'll be at the back, thanks. All right, great. I just wanted to point out that Lizzie and Dan came to speak at our meetup all the way from Glasgow, which I've been told is in Scotland, so really far, <laughs> far away. That's not that far. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. All right, to finish off. We're gonna do announcements. So if anyone has anything that they would like to share, please raise your hand and I'll rush over with the microphone so that, so that the whole of YouTube can hear your announcement. There's one. I'm sorry. Is it okay to advertise a job posting? Uh, yes. Thank you, Heather. I work for a company called PGI, a protection group international. Uh, we do a range of things, including social media monitoring, geopolitical risk analysis, and uh, enhanced due diligence. Uh, we're looking for uh, any social media uh, analysts or social media uh, monitors, uh, predominantly Arabic speaking, but we take people uh, with all languages or no languages as well. Um, so my company's PGI Protection Group International. Their website is www.pgitl.com. And uh, also Google them, uh, and I'll hang around a bit afterwards if you'd like to speak to me about any of those roles. Thank you. Thank you. More announcements, events, jobs, opinions? Cool. Um, yeah, I'd just like to plug our charity and organization. So it's uh, Conflict Data, where the Conflict and Environment Observatory. So it's using a lot of the kind of stuff we've learned about tonight, but taking it one step further to look at the environmental consequences 
of conflicts which are far and wide and have many derived kind of humanitarian effects long afterwards. Um, and, you know, potentially we can use a lot of that information to not predict, that's a strong word, but maybe look at areas where things might happen in the future. Um, so, yeah, that no, was just a plug for the Conflict and Environment Observatory. Check us out on uh, Twitter and Google us. We've got some good stuff coming up on Yemen in the next month. Cool, thank you. Anyone else? Nope. I have announcement. Sorry, obviously. So we actually have a little anniversary with our meetup. We've been doing this for three years. In those three years, we managed to get over 3,000 members in our meetup group. We've hosted 14 events. We had 31, uh, we had over 16, uh, hundred people attending. They said they're attending on meetup.com, so I'm gonna count them as that they actually showed up. Uh, we had 31 talks, 36 speakers, five panelists, and only one heckler. So, um, so obviously that's you know, a lot of numbers, so I was thinking you know, how do we communicate these data points in an engaging and meaningful way. So I've created a 3D pie chart. <laughs> uh, but I wanted it even more sexy, so I turned it into a 3D exploded donut chart, and I've added some real world shading. It's really about the, the final touch. So yeah, so thank you very much for keep coming to our events. Because from that pie chart, you can clearly see that our meetup is about 99% community and only 0.0002% hackling. Uh, I think we can stay in the venue for 20 more minutes, so feel free to finish the conversations you wanted to have. And the last step of the meetup is going to the pub, which is the Fox. So if you're going to get right out of the building and you're going to turn right, you're going to find it on a corner about two blocks down. So thank you very much. Good night. <laughs>